The Allen Lund Company appreciates all of the dedicated carriers it takes to move loads across the U.S. Stay safe. OOIDA, representing America's truckers since 1973, presents Landline Now with your host, Mark Reddick. This week is Mission Military Appreciation here on Landline Now, and we're talking about our troops and veterans. But we also want to discuss how taking part in this can be good for you as a truck driver. I'll talk with Sylvia Dodson, Mike Shermerly, and Jay Grimes of OOIDA. And to take part, just go to OOIDA.com and click on Become a Member. You can join or renew your membership for a discounted rate, and 10% of that will go into the Truckers for Troops Fund, with OOIDA matching that money. Also on today's program, will the free market end up solving the truck parking crisis? Tyson Fisher of Landline Magazine joins us with updates on plans that include tens of thousands of paid truck parking spaces nationwide. And finally, Colorado lawmakers finish work on a bill that would change chain laws, left lane rules, and speed enforcement in the state. Scott gets the details from our state legislative expert, Keith Goebel. But first, the news with Scott Thompson. Thanks, Mark. We'll begin with our weekly check on diesel prices nationwide. The Energy Information Administration reports that last week's average dipped more than a nickel from the previous week to $3.89 a gallon. That marks the first time in more than three months the prices dipped below the $3.90 mark. All 10 regions on the EIA survey recorded price declines last week, led by the lower Atlantic, where the average was down more than $0.07. Cents. Meanwhile, more of the same this week, according to ProMiles.com. They had the national average on Tuesday morning at $3.92 a gallon, down close to $0.04 cents from the same day last week. As with the EIA report, ProMiles has prices down in every region across the country. Spot freight volume last week was up 2.6% compared to the previous week, making for a 7.2% increase over the normal five-year average. Brent Hutto with Truck Stop says they've seen some ups and downs in the market of late, but that overall pressure has gone down over the past couple of weeks. It went down in the 60s, but it came back up last week in the 70s, which means the marketplace is still kind of bumping along at this sort of, uh, if, if, you, if you do a lot of homework in it, you can probably survive through it. If you don't, then a lot of stuff that you move is marginal. But load posting volumes is what I look at from the market demand index. That's when I said it was in the 60s and 70s. 71.82 this week is the market demand index. But the load posting volumes are within the market demand index. And they actually increased week to week. They had two weeks of decreases, and they went went back up last week. And, and the thing that I'd love for the listeners to think about is that the actual load availability in the market is still almost 7.5% above what it normally is in any year. So there's plenty of freight in the marketplace, but you got to look for it because rates, even with an infinite, and when I talk rates, I mean rates with fuel, because you got to always think about the fuel in this thing. It stayed the same. They were two dollars and thirty-seven cents, and they were two weeks ago, and they were two dollars and thirty-seven cents last week. Hato says the biggest rate increase they saw was in reefer, which was up sixteen cents to two dollars and thirty-seven cents. New details tonight about the Francis Scott Key Bridge collapse in Baltimore. The Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration extending its emergency declaration in response to the tragedy. The agency had previously announced that the order would expire on May 8th, but on Tuesday extended that another month to June 8th. Beyond the extension, the declaration keeps all the previous conditions in place for carriers providing direct assistance. That includes a relaxation of hours of service requirements, along with other waivers and exemptions. For full details, we have a link at landlinenow.com. Interstate 95 through Norwalk, Connecticut is back open following a three-vehicle crash last week that led to a tanker truck fire. It was a quick turnaround. The highway was shut down Thursday immediately after the crash, which damaged an overpass above I-95. That bridge was demolished on Friday. The roadway was repaved and fixed up over the weekend, and all lanes of travel on I-95 were reopened by rush hour on Monday. That's relief to commuters who were forced last week to take alternate routes around the closure. Connecticut Governor Ned Lamont said during a news conference on Monday that it was an all-hands-on-deck situation. You know, we came down here on Friday to meet you guys, and it was hell getting here. You remember that? The hours and hours of delays. Look at the traffic here on 95, moving fast in both directions. You know, too often uh, in government you have politicians who uh, over-promise and under-deliver. Not the people standing behind me here. 
these guys over delivered. Their recovery was attributed in part to the Federal Highway Administration releasing $3 million in quick release emergency relief funds. As for the price of a permanent fix, Garrett Ucolito, commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Transportation, said that's still being figured out. Until we get all the bills in from all the different parties, we won't know. Um, we think the total cost will be upwards um, around $20 million clean up and rebuild. U.S. Senator Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut said he's going to ask the Federal Highway Administration to pick up the bill when it comes due through emergency relief funds. New research is pointing out the states with the best and worst bridges in the nation. Using data from the Bureau of Transportation Statistics, legal funding firm High Rise Legal Funding analyzed a number of bridges in each state that are in poor condition, meaning the presence of cracks, damage, or other instabilities that could lead to failure. Rhode Island earned the top spot on the unenviable list with the highest number of dangerous bridges. Roughly 22% of bridges in the state, nearly 700 of them, are in need of repair, according to the report. West Virginia had the second highest percentage of bridges in poor condition, followed by Iowa. On the other end of the spectrum, the states with the most well-kept bridges were Texas, Nevada, and Arizona. A Canadian truck driver who went missing late last month has been found dead. Ontario Provincial Police say 51-year-old Brian Lush was found dead on Monday. Lush was last seen on April 24th at a truck stop near Cornwall, Ontario, going inside and buying some things. Then he disappeared. His cell phone was found inside his abandoned truck. Police haven't released any other details for now, but say they do not suspect foul play. A reminder, the Commercial Vehicle Safety Alliance's International Road Check event starts next week. Over three days, starting Tuesday, May 14th, certified law enforcement personnel will be out in force conducting routine North American Standard Level 1 inspections at way and inspection stations, temporary signs, and mobile patrols. Each year, International Road Check places a special emphasis on a category of violations. This year, there will be two focus areas, tractor protection systems and alcohol and controlled substance possession. CVSA says the possession and use of controlled substances and alcohol remains a significant concern for motor carriers, drivers, and the general public. For more details about International Road Check and the 37-step inspection procedure so you can get ready, head to cvsa.org. We'll also have more details right here on Landline Now as we approach next week's Blitz. The state of Oregon is touting the success of a new initiative designed to get more truck drivers on the road. Officials say 325 people have gotten their commercial driver's licenses over the past two years through the Driving Prosperity Program. It includes four to eight weeks of training at a cost of about $5,000 per participant. The money to fund the program comes via a $3.4 million grant from the U.S. Department of Commerce's Economic Development Administration. And finally, if you bought a Powerball ticket at an Indiana truck stop last November and haven't checked the numbers yet, you might want to get on that. Hoosier Lottery says someone bought a winning ticket at the Love's Travel Stop in DeMott on November 11th, worth $50,000. But that person hasn't come forward yet, which is a problem, since the ticket is set to expire on Thursday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. If any of this rings a bell, search your cab, your wallet, your house, wherever you might have stashed a since-forgotten Powerball ticket, because you might just have a winner. That's Landline Now News for today. I'm Scott Thompson. Thanks, Scott. Congratulations to Michael Griggs of Beaumont, Texas. He's received the OOIDA Safe Driving Award for five years of safe, accident-free driving. The OOIDA Safe Driving Award program is sponsored by Shell Rotella. On Thursday, Marty Ellis and OOIDA's tour truck, The Spirit of the American Trucker, will be at the Speedway location in Calvert City, Kentucky. That's located at exit 27 off Interstate 24. Stop in, say hi to Marty, and join OOIDA for a $10 discount. Next, I'll discuss what OOIDA offers truckers with Sylvia Dodson, Mike Shermerly, and Jay Grimes. I'm Mark Reddick, and this is Landline Now. Thanks for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe. If you want more content, go to landline.media to get updated news, information, and archived editions of our show. Once again, that's landline.media. Capital Reman is your leading source for quality remanufactured engines and components. Capital Reman stands ready to serve all OOIDA members to help reduce costly engine repairs or replacement. Visit CapitalReman.com today and use code OOIDA10 to save. 
Get the most power performance out of your rig with Howe's Diesel Defender. It provides maximum lubricity and contains specialized IDX4 detergent to clean and prevent deposits and safely removes harmful water. Visit Howe'sProducts.com for more information. Attention professional drivers, do you owe money to the IRS? Integrity Tax Relief Group frees drivers from IRS trouble. Call for help now, 855-976-4291. That's 855-976-4291. It's tested and proven. Burn 2.1% less fuel when you balance all wheel ends with Centromatic. Call 800-523-8473 to get the OOIDA discount. Landline Now. Welcome back. This week is Mission Military Appreciation here on Landline Now. During this week, we're talking about our military, the troops who are serving right now, and the veterans who have served, as well as the efforts of OOIDA to support both of those groups through the Truckers for Troops program. But this week, we also want to discuss how taking part in this can be good for you as a truck driver. OOIDA offers a number of benefits to members who are out on the road, all of which can help you run your business, stay compliant with regulations, and overall improve your life. Here to discuss some of the benefits of membership are OOIDA Membership Manager, Sylvia Dodson, the Association's Marketing Director, Mike Shermley, and OOIDA Director of Federal Affairs, Jay Grimes. Everybody, thank you very much for joining me. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Good to be with you. Now, before we get into the programs, um, the, the whole point of all of this uh, is the core mission, Jay, which is representing truckers. Um, you've been a big part of that effort for quite some time. Can you give us kind of the Reader's Digest version of what OOIDA does for its members in terms of representation? Yeah, so OIDA is the largest trade association devoted exclusively to promoting the interests of owner-operators and professional drivers. And uh, we've got a government affairs department based in Washington and certainly here uh, in Grain Valley, promoting policies that will help small business truckers and the men and women who make their living behind the wheel. And our advantage is, is that's who – that's the only membership uh, that we get to work for. We're not dealing with hundreds of special interests. We are fighting for their rights, more equitable fed federal regulations, anything that can help them in terms of uh, Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration policy – Congressional policy, legislation, regulation, state regulation, too. Uh, we work with a lot of uh, state governments. So really covering everything from federal, state, local level on any issue that relates to, to trucking and transportation. Now, uh, Mike and Jay, I want to kind of ask both of you or, or either one of you here, all the programs that we're going to talk about here bring in money, and that money goes to the representation effort. Why do that? Why is is that the method that OOIDA uses? Well, I mean, OOIDA, does, uh, OOIDA discovered years ago that they had to have a revenue source to do all of this work in Washington. Uh, at that time, of course, we were doing a lot of uh, court cases as well, uh, which all take funding. And uh, the benefit programs were put together in order to generate that revenue, uh, truck insurance being obviously the, uh, the biggest of, of the ones here in the, uh, the association, but the life and health benefits and some of the smaller ones as well. And those revenues beyond the cost of actually uh, applying the programs uh, goes back into the association to uh, pay for the lobbying work we do for the court cases and some of the other you know, initiatives that we take. Okay. Now, one of the, the obvious things we talk about when we talk about benefits are discounts and rebates that are offered to the association's members. And um, I, I want to talk a little bit, Mike, about why that's part of the overall effort. Why discounts and rebates? Well, we are there to serve the members and give them things that they can use in their everyday working lives. Uh, you know, they don't have the uh, the benefit of being part of large fleets who have discounts that, that they've arranged. Um, what we do is we try and pull together the, the buying power of our members to negotiate these discounts with vendors. And over the 25 years that I've been here, I mean, they've come, they've gone, you know, uh, we've, we've put on some great uh, benefits. Sometimes uh, the, the, because of marketing decisions on the part of the vendor, they may um, decide to discontinue, but then new ones come in. And they come in 
coming from various venues. I mean, sometimes it's through the advertising in the magazine. Sometimes we get approached directly. And sometimes actually members contact us and say, hey, we've got a, you know, a, some, a, a chain of tire shops or a chain of repair shops uh, that really is interested in doing work with us. Why don't you give them a call? And that's, you know, we bring them in like that as well. But it's all to give the members some some tangible benefits to their membership, you know, by 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 being able to get discounts uh, through through these major players. So, Mike, what are some of the big programs or or the ones that really seem to resonate the most with members? Well, over the years, uh, the the OEM programs have been uh, quite successful. Now, a few of those have fallen away just recently, but certainly we're always looking for the for the, for the main uh, items. We're looking for tires. We're looking for OEMs. Uh, we're looking for repair shops. We're looking for uh, certainly our fuel card has has grown into something really quite substantial in terms of the discounts we have and the network that we have. We probably have. One one of the largest networks in the industry at the moment, and some of the best de- uh, discounts in the industry, um, and so that, that you know these are things that members can really save on. I mean, when you talk about you know forty five or a discount at thirty five dollars a year, I mean that's well worth the price of of, of membership when you, when you can get these kind of discounts. Well, and of course, you mentioned the OEM discounts. And I mean, uh, when you're purchasing a truck, if you get a big discount on that, that can pay for your membership for years. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, Sylvia, I want to turn to you here a little bit because when you first came here to OOIDA a few years ago, um, (laughs) you started in the truck insurance program. And so you know a lot about that. Can you kind of talk a little bit about the insurance program and, and what kinds of things it offers to members? Well, I mean, truck insurance, we have full phase of truck insurance from liabilities to cargo, physical damage, um, passenger accident, uh, general liabilities. We have all uh, we have a full full line of truck insurance as well as life and health benefits and that kind of thing. Yeah, and life and health benefits, I think people get a little confused sometimes on that. What's involved? Just give us a couple of examples of programs that they have in that department. Well, the big one's occupational accident. That's our big one. And then they do have life the life insurance is different different levels of life insurance. Now, when you get membership, you automatically get $1,000 free AD&D. And uh, accidental death and dismemberment, say that really fast, right? But anyway... <laughs> um, but and then they can add different levels and get higher up if they want, you know, in the big programs and things like that. Okay. One of the other things uh, that that is very important here is the compliance or business services area. And uh, the compliance is particularly important because, of course, that's helping truckers out with kind of – basic regulatory compliance with things like reviewing leases and all of that. Um, Jay, that's kind of putting the regulatory part into force, isn't it? Yeah, no question. It's really kind of an all-hands-on-deck approach throughout the association from department to department. We all kind of hear the same issues that drivers face and want to try and address those in in the most efficient and effective way possible. So uh, from the government affairs team, we're working with Mark marketing, membership, compliance, the switchboard office, hearing what our members think, hearing what they need, and trying uh, to get uh, some improvements, some reforms in Washington that can help our membership. Okay. Um, uh, well, and a lot of times they're, they're our lead. You know, yeah. they give us that lead in to go check something out or to look into something or something's happening in a certain area, and that will open the door to the compliance area as well and the regulatory for them to check into what's going on with the state or CVSA actions or things like that. So it all, everybody plays a part of this All connected. It's all connected from our members all the way. One thing over the years that I think some people have been kind of surprised that we're involved in is CMCI, which is the Association's Drug Testing Consortium. And, uh, of course, drug testing is kind of a sensitive area for a lot of truckers. Uh, you know, it, it's it's something that's never been a major cause of accidents, but nonetheless, it's something truckers have to go through. Why did we get involved? Why did the association get involved in drug testing? Well, at the time, drug testing was coming down the pipeline, and uh, we did fight it. Uh, we fought it very hard. But more importantly, you know, sometimes when issues are kind of, a, 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 it, it's inevitable, inevitable that they're going to come, uh, it's important that they're actually applied correctly 
and with you know the 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 rights of the driver in mind. And there are a lot of things uh, built into the drug testing uh, regulations that we were a part of actually writing or taking out to make sure that they didn't abuse the drivers and their rights. So once this became law, um, we obviously needed to bring something to the market and to our members uh, that would help them be compliant with the laws. And so uh, we have CMCI is our drug testing consortium uh, for for many, many members. Um, Okay. Um, One other thing I did want to review kind of in the general business services area is permits and licensing. And that involves a lot of different things, but one of the big areas is helping people get their authority. And still, can you talk about that a little bit, why it is that we offer that particular thing? Well, it's just, it's hard for the, uh, for the members to do it on their own. And when you find someone that with the forms that the government has you fill out these days, I mean, I've heard the girls mention 43 pages of stuff that they got to fill out to try to get things filed and done. And we just are there to make it easier and do it for them and give them the proper direction and guidance so they don't miss out on something or, or, or they don't feel something out right or they get knocked out because they forgot to do this. You know, we're there, we're the professionals, we're the experts to say, you need this, this, and this. This is your operation. I would recommend this. And we get them all set up and get them ready to go. I remember there was an instance many years ago where they had hired a private firm to handle a lot of this at FMCSA. And it was actually the permits people here at OOIDA that were basically helping the, the people working people for FMCSA it. learn how to do yes, this. Sir. And, and, of course, there were all kinds of problems with people getting their authority at that time. And if it hadn't have been for OOIDA, they wouldn't it, have done. Yeah, yeah. it wouldn't have been good. Okay. Um, Jay, I want to talk about something that you interact with a lot, and that is the foundation, the OOIDA Foundation, the research arm of the association. And I'm wondering if you can kind of briefly spell out what it is they do and how it fits into the whole effort. Yeah. So the OOIDA Foundation is a nonprofit uh, research arm of the association, and, and they are looking at a whole host of issues and data related to, to highway safety, the trucking industry whole lot of other things. And uh, really, the data and research that they do really, I think, paints an accurate, up-to-date picture of what's happening on the highways and what policies can be uh, effective in improving safety. And certainly, when you have the data that the foundation brings and you can share that with DOT, FMCSA, lawmakers, really helps uh, make the argument that we're trying uh, to portray and convey uh, to folks in Washington who don't really have any clue about the trucking industry. So the data, the research they provide really goes a long way uh, in achieving our goals from the legislative and regulatory side. And of course, one of the things they do that's equally important, I would think, is kind of the active debunking research right. that's kind of skewed against truckers. No question. And uh, this longstanding debate uh, of driver shortage versus actual driver retention uh, has been an ongoing struggle that we face with uh, lawmakers and, and the data that they provide, the economic history uh, that they give us um I think has really gone a long way in in convincing lawmakers, no, it's not about addressing a driver shortage. It's about addressing driver retention and the ways that we need to uh, improve the industry, improve driver compensation, improve some of these uh, unnecessary regulations are where we need to start with, not just with uh, attracting a different pool of of potential drivers. I was just going to say that the foundation also pulls through the uh, uh, scholarship program. Mm -hmm. for children and grandchildren of our members, and they provide the scholarship information. And uh, the scholarship program is from the foundation as well, and uh, they provide um, scholarships for children and grandchildren of our members. And we provide five scholarships. They provide five scholarships a year, and we follow that through with the uh, kids as well for the four years. If they go four years to college or if they go into, like, uh, trade school— Matter of fact, our lead winner this year was the diesel, going into diesel mechanic school. So that was kind of cool. Okay. And, of course, there's also the education aspect of the Truck to Success course. Uh, Yep. Well, we're out of time, but I want to thank you all for joining me. I wish we could talk more about some of these things, but, you know, we always have to meet the clock. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you. Odie says bye. (laughs) 
I've been talking with OOIDA membership manager, Sylvia Dodson, the association's marketing director, Mike Shermerly, and OOIDA director of federal affairs, Jay Grimes. Landline Now will be back in a moment. Penske owns and operates some of the best maintained vehicles on the planet. Our used trucks come with a five-year maintenance report and pre-sale inspection. So if you're in the market for a top quality pre-owned truck, look no further. Search our inventory today at PenskeUsedTrucks.com. Control your toll costs and eliminate tolling headaches with prepass tolls. Prepass tolls means toll volume discounts. Just one invoice for all tolls and fewer violations. Call 877-878-5970 or go to prepass.com. Ready to make more money? Use a better load board. For a limited time, get 50% off Truck Stop Load Board Pro. Just go to truckstop.com slash go and enter promo code READY2024 when you purchase Load Board Pro. A blank space on many maps with a distance between parking spaces seemingly as great as infinity. It is the boundary that separates safety and security from the dangers of the road the space between electronic signs and a place in which to rest. It is not a dimension of the imagination, but instead the reality faced by truck drivers every single day. It is a place we call the parking zone. Here are your guides for this journey into parking news good and bad, Scott Thompson and Tyson Fisher. Thanks, Mark, and hello, Tyson. Good to see you. Good being here. So every time we get together... For one of these segments, we talk about the latest ins and outs of the truck parking crisis, what the federal government doing is doing, what the states are doing. We talk about private companies and truck stops and how they're adding additional truck parking yep. spots here and there. Um, and we also talk about how we're making dents in this massive problem, this problem of uh, the truck parking crisis. The progress, as we know, is quite slow. I bring this yep. up because I know you've been thinking about this, and you're always thinking about this, really, but... You've been thinking about this in a new context, um, looking at these private companies now, paid parking. Um, and I know you've kind of landed in, uh, I don't know if you've landed on a, on a conclusion or sure. you're, kind of, you're kind of toying with this idea that yeah. maybe this is going to be the way that we kind of get out of this. I won't put words in your mouth. I'll kind of let you, you take the ball here and run. But sure. this is something you've been thinking about, and, and you think it might be an actual maybe solution. Yeah, so let's give a little background here. So you know, there's there are about 313,000 truck parking spaces, based on the last bit of information we had. 90%, about 90% of all of those truck parking spaces are, are like from truck stops, the, the private sector. So needless to say, kind of as you alluded to, the solution to the truck parking crisis is going to rely heavily on the, on the, on the private sector of, you know, so, uh, so, but historically the private sector has to address truck parking via truck stops, you know, uh, right. your, your loves, your pilot, travel centers, America, so on and so forth. But for decades, the private sector has had a pretty sweet deal with truckers, which is in exchange for free parking, truckers will spend money on food, you know, fuel, fuel and food yep. and, and, and whatnot. So everybody wins. Truckers get a one-stop shop for rest and fuel and whatnot, and these entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs earn money, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, job growth in the local community, whatnot. However, so over the past decade, it's probably been longer than that, to be honest with you, uh, the truck parking shortage across the country has gotten worse, uh, kind of to the point to where it's kind of a dire situation. Uh, and, and that situation is being exacerbated by local governments who don't want truck stops in their town. You and I have talked exhaustively yes, we have. <laughs> about yep. that issue, yep. right? Um, so consequently, this void exists in the freight market, and you know, kind of as the saying goes, like uh, uh, necessity is the mother of invention, and that quote's kind of going to make sense here pretty soon. <laughs> okay, uh, we'll, we'll circle back to it. We'll yeah. circle back to that. So, you know, uh, the key to a profitable business is to provide a product or a service that fulfills a need. That's kind of the idea of of a business. And so, over the past several years, you know, entrepreneurs, I, I think they just realized that there is such a dire need for parking that they can make money by offering truck parking and truck parking only. And that's kind of the trend that I've been noticing lately. So that need 
uh, it, it's just so great that there's no incentive to offer amenities like fuel being a big one, mm-hmm. but even like you know food, showers, bathrooms. Uh, yeah, I think bathrooms might be one of the exceptions, and, and we'll get into that as well. Sure. But. Yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah, so you know those things are unnecessary financial burdens where you can just easily make millions of dollars by you know just paving a lot and then paying or charging for parking. Um, so that is the shift that I am seeing. So it's kind of the shift towards parking, the parking aspect being the sole revenue generating service that's being provided. And so you know as I mentioned just a bit ago, you know. Parking itself has never really been a business, all right? So fuel and food has been the business, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, Free parking was just provided to entice truckers to kind of spend money on the business. But I think today investors are realizing that truckers, you know, uh, know, out of necessity, I guess you can say, uh, they will pay for a place to park. uh, They'll they'll just pay for just a place to park their truck. And right, so yeah. we've seen several examples of that very recently. So Outpost, for example, now formerly a, a semi sto yep. just received millions of dollars in Series A funding to create, uh, which is essentially a network of truck parking facilities. Throughout uh, the U.S., right? Throughout the U.S., yeah. right, in, in major corridors nonetheless. Uh, and these are essentially yards with a restroom, mm-hmm. <laughs> to put it you know, pretty simply. Granted, these are very secured They've yards. Got, yeah, they got security fences and things like that. Out, Absolutely, right? yeah. uh, I think they were going to provide some office space too. So you know, it, I, I, it's maybe an oversimplification, but for the most part, it is a yard with a restroom, right. parked your truck. Uh, then we got a, a, a holding company called Contrade. Uh, I think we've recently reported on that as well. Yep. They plan on adding forty-five thousand truck parking spaces by essentially doing the same thing. Uh, uh, the Truck Parking Club, you know, that is a very popular app that everyone knows to be, you know, the Airbnb of truck parking. But you, you, you see these, there, there, there's a clear trend here in my point of view. And that trend is just, again, charging truckers for parking for a parking spot only. So the good news is uh, the private sector will be able to create you know, tens of thousands of truck parking spaces, you know, uh, in a relatively short period of time, too. Yeah. So that could substantially put a put a substantial dent, at the very least, a substantial dent in a truck parking crisis, you know? Yeah. And I, I see both sides of this. Sure. And obviously that that's the good side of the coin. The other side of the coin is fuel fuel prices are up. Uh, you know, it's not it's not easy. Cost of operations is up, as we've reported on before. And now you'd be adding another expense, essentially, right? right. Uh, to basically, <laughs> again, just park your your uh, your truck when you're required to, based on hours of service limits. Right. Um, it's interesting. I mean, the conversation's interesting because it is a free market kind of thing, right? There's a need. Private enterprises stepping in yeah. and trying to fill the void there. It is unfortunate, however, that truck drivers are going to be the one paying the price for this. And we don't necessarily know what this is going to look like. We don't. In terms of price, right? You would hope that it wouldn't be too high. But no. when you're talking about a network, and I know you spoke with the uh, one of the co-founders mm. of, uh, of Outpost, um, and he laid out, right, what this network will look like. You basically will have, um, you know, uh, an agreement. You'll sign a agreement with the company, and you'll be able to basically go to any of these right. satellite uh, parking lots that are throughout the country. Again, it, it just it's interesting, but at the same time, it just is frustrating because we're talking about another expense here. And, uh, again, I don't know how that's going to work out, but— We'll see. Yeah. Um, and you brought up a good point, though, that I was going to uh, mention real quick. Yeah. Um, and, and, oh, Really quick, I want to point out that I'm not criticizing any of these. Oh yeah, absolutely. Smart entre- I mean, no, no, is, no, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it is what it is, and you 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 hit the nail on the head. This is how the free market works. Yep. <laughs> and so yeah. that being said, if the government cannot address a need, then yes, the private sector will show up and, and fulfill that need. However, this is one of those situations where I think the government does have the jurisdiction to address the issue. It just moves so slow. It moves We're slowly. Moving so slowly. And then when you look at how much 
parking they offer through millions of dollars. Like I think at the last calculation I did, it was more than $150,000 per spot. You know, they're not as efficient <laughs> with their money as the private sector yeah. can be. And then you'd be talking, you know, an extra 23 spots in, in one rest area, which great. I mean, that, that certainly helps. But right. you talk about dents. That's like a, a nick. <laughs> you know, that's right. like barely a dent. So, but yeah, that's, I mean, that's kind of what I wanted to point out. It's like we're, the trend, I think at the current rate we're going, reserved paid parking in a parking yard is kind of going to be the future of truck parking, for better or for worse. Um, you know, I, I think that comes with some uh, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, again, we'll see what the government does as far as stepping up to the plate. There's that truck parking bill that's out there that can definitely help. Um, as far as truck stops go, that is a local government jurisdiction that we can uh, – I don't know how we address that or if we can. Yeah. But um, I think that's just something that – it's a new reality that I think truckers are going to have to face, which is if you want a place to park and you want to do it legally, you're going to have to pay for that spot. And I, and I think that's the, that's the shift that we are seeing. And it's interesting you point that out because, as you mentioned, these companies have been around for a little while. And obviously, this is not a new idea per se. But to your point, it does feel like we've got some momentum behind this idea with, again, with Outpost, uh, with uh, the other company um, whose name I cannot remember right now. Contrade. Contrade. Thank yes. you. It'll be interesting to see how successful they are yeah. and how quickly they put these these lots up. And again, how much use they get as well, because sure. there is a need out there. Again, you're talking about paid parking, which I know isn't the most popular idea out there. But if the alternative is parking on the side of a, right. a highway or an on-ramp or an off-ramp or what have you, you know, maybe that is the way we're going here. Um, but you, you kind of see this as a... I guess, a, a turning point. You, you kind of see that this is maybe something that is going to really take off. I, I do think it's going to take off. And I, again, I think the the benefit here is it will meaningfully address the truck parking shortage. And I think at the end of the day, that is the most important thing. The amenities, I do think, are necessary. You know, we talked about that before yeah. with the uh, the survey about what truckers want that basically say they just want a place to eat and rest and shower. Mm -hmm. um, I, those will still be available. I think what these truck parking yards are going to offer is basically a, a last-minute uh, decision. You know, when you can't find that, part, that spot at a truck stop or anywhere else you would like to go, there's going to be these giant yards. And let's make the most, these are going to be giant yards. We're talking hundreds and hundreds of parking spots in one location, yeah. you know, um, strategically located too. And so um, it's just going to be one of those things to where, you know, you're going to have the truck stops available, but when they're not, you know, you're going to have these private sector yards that are going to be like, hey, I know this sucks. You don't want to have to pay for it, but we got a spot for you right here. You know, uh, we'll always have a spot for you right here. Um, and, you know, just, you know, utilize that when you need to. Because like you pointed out, it's either that or park illegally. And not only will that cost you money, but we have seen situations where that has cost truckers lives, yeah. you know. And it's yeah. just so you don't, uh, you know, that's just something that no trucker wants to face. And, again, the private sector, they're they're stepping up to the plate and they're they're doing what, they, the, what, what they're known to do, which is, you know, uh, seize the opportunity here. Yeah, we always talk about, too, that it's going to take a village. You know, we've got private enterprise here. We talk, we talk all the time about the slow-moving federal process. <laughs> right. States are talking about this. It seems like more and more attention is being directed toward this problem, which is encouraging. So in an ideal world, we've got these private companies coming in and putting yeah. these big yards in. It would be great if the, the truck parking bill – uh, bills in the House and Senate went through, and we've got that going. Yeah. And we'd have states. It seems like they're picking up some of the slack here. We don't live in a perfect world. <laughs> I'm I'm just saying that in a perfect world, it would be nice that if all of these kings things came together relatively quickly sure. in the next couple of years, and then two years from now, when we're sitting here talking, we're talking about hey, all the problem areas that we see now, all the hot spots, we've only got a few here and there, and they're being addressed, and we're getting there. Again, perfect world. Right. I don't know if we're going to get there, but uh, it is an interesting thing. And really, uh, I know you're tracking this, and you'll continue to keep us updated as well. But uh, we appreciate you keeping an eye on this, and 
We'll see where it goes. Maybe yeah. we'll get to a perfect world. I don't know, Tyson. Maybe I'll be more optimistic next time around. Optimistic but, world. Yes, let's yes, go with that. So. Tyson, we appreciate <laughs> it. Thanks so much. Good. Thanks for having me here. You can check out Tyson's work each and every day at landline.media and in every issue of Landline Magazine. We've got to take a break, but Landline Now continues right after this. Are you tired of the IRS following you around like a dark cloud? Call 888-557-4020 and get your life back. Firestone tires are for more of everything, with more durability for more miles and more confidence in your fleet. Firestone's tested tires help fleets save with value where it matters most. Learn more at BridgestoneNationalFleet.com slash 4MoreMiles. Today's rising costs affect everyone. Replace your harmonic damper with a genuine Vibratech TVD viscous damper to prevent costly repairs and downtime. Keep your money in your pocket and your truck on the road with Vibratech TVD. Recommended replacement at 500,000 miles or 15,000 hours. Since you started, what you've loved about trucking is the freedom. Heading out on your favorite route, a good driving song, and thinking about truck insurance. Well, maybe not that last one. That's why we're here. At OOIDA, we have a full range of truck insurance products, expert advice, and great customer service, helping you get the right coverage for your operation. Go to OOIDA.com, because your job is to drive. Our job is to help with everything else. Landline now, welcome back. Big changes could be in store for Colorado truckers if a new bill gets the governor's signature. Joining us with the details on that, plus a few other states considering left lane changes for semis, is Keith Goebel, state legislative editor for Landline Magazine. Keith, always good to see you. Scott, good to see you. How's it going? Doing all right over here. Um, We're going to talk a little bit, actually spend a lot of time here in Colorado, Keith. Um, We've got this bill. It includes a lot of truck-related language, and um, some of it, I guess, people might be happy about. Some of it, maybe people won't be happy about. What exactly is in this bill uh, that's on the governor's desk right now? Yeah, Colorado legislature has been busy this year talking about truck issues. Uh, and, been, and largely, <laughs> truck issues are incl- included in, uh, if that's a word, in, in, in <laughs> one bill. There's multiple provisions in this one bill. And, uh, and yeah, they've, they're addressing a lot. Uh, safety is the overall theme, as, as you would probably uh, assume. Um, specifically, driving on highways there uh, in the winter months, uh, I-70 uh, being a focus, but trying to, with this legislation, expand on that, uh, include more areas uh, as they have, uh, the lawmakers have heard from the Colorado DOT uh, about uh, concerns that they have, again, largely as this is relating to uh, trucks um, and, and not being chained uh, and uh, trying to help out at the same time as is um, authorizing essentially uh, more enforcement of, uh, of of those concerns. Yeah, certainly in terms of, and we'll go through each issue here kind of in, individually, uh, starting with chain laws, as you mentioned there. Mm. Uh, this really would be an expansion, again, would be if the governor signs it into law. Uh, An expansion, I know lawmakers there in Colorado have talked about, as you mentioned, the safety concerns here. There's also a concern about roads being closed because of crashes involving trucks that maybe Mm -hmm. weren't chained when maybe they could or or should have been. I know Glenwood Canyon's been mentioned a number of times as well, but this really is about expanding the area, right, that uh, chains would be required. Yeah, trying to make sure that uh, as as it's, uh, presented by by bill sponsors, trying to make sure that, that truck drivers are are prepared. They they essentially have identified that you know the Colorado uh, based uh, operators. That's not the focus of this. That they do have people coming from you know outside the region uh, that aren't prepared and um, and trying to uh, you know make make changes to kind of eliminate some of the issues that they do have. But yeah, you know, on, on the topic of, of chain laws, you know, as it is now, and I know folks know that, they they have their seasonal uh, chain law requirement uh, on I-70, I, I believe it's from Dotsero, if that's not a correct pronunciation, mm-hmm. to the Morrison area. Uh, this legislation be expanding that. It would apply for, for trucks that are traveling on I-70 west of Morrison, uh, but it would also apply for uh, Interstate 25 or 
for that matter, any other interstate or U.S. highway or state highway that is west of I-25. So, uh, yeah, making it more expansive as far as um, uh, of those chain law requirements. Um, but, yeah, it definitely has been a concern. Uh, one of the highlights has been Glenwood Canyon. Uh, there was a lawmaker out of that area uh, who was speaking when they were talking about it on the on the House floor uh, saying that Glenwood Canyon was closed for nearly 35 days uh, over the course of the past year. And, you know, the um, the poster child, I guess you would say, for why that happened was attributed to trucks. Now, of course, that's something that, uh, you know, folks, I, I know even here with the OIDA would, would, would question, um, you may have an incident even that involves a truck. I mean, is a truck the cause of the incident? Right. Um, but uh, I, 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 it, on, on that particular topic, I don't, I don't, I don't want to digress from this particular issue in Colorado. But, but there, there are there are instances around the country where we see. Um, uh, I believe it was Michigan. I saw a video in in an effort to support uh, a, a pursuit to restrict trucks from the left lane. Uh, they they were showing um, a video that a truck had on board, a front view and a rear view of this truck out in the left lane, and you see a vehicle on its right just start coming into their lane, mm-hmm. and there is a collision and. Um, Truck did absolutely nothing wrong, but yet it is provided as video support for restricting them trucks the from the left, left lane. lane. Yeah. Anyway, huh. I, we, we can go back on topic here as far as Colorado goes, <laughs> but I just kind of felt like I had to share that. Just well, to, it doesn't. Yeah, that, that doesn't make any sense, yeah. obviously. And uh, to to show that video and show it as proof of something that the truck was doing wrong <laughs> is uh, yeah. I, I'm not sure that they accomplished what they were trying to accomplish there, but uh, who knows. Um, Real quick with Colorado, you know, we mentioned Glenwood Canyon there. I know uh, part of this bill would be speed limit enforcement zones. I think mm-hmm. Glenwood Canyon's mentioned there, or maybe even the focal point there. There's also a left lane use issue there uh, in this bill too, right? Uh, yeah, there's a left lane uh, restriction. Um, yeah, as it is now, we talked about, yeah, Glenwood Canyon, uh, as you're going through I-70, what the legislation would do is uh, it would add five more areas to the truck lane restriction, um, you know, Eisenhower Tunnel, uh, Vail Pass, Floyd Hill, uh, among a couple of others, where, yeah, if, if, if you're traveling on a highway that's got at least three lanes heading in one direction, trucks would be prohibited from being out in the left lane. Uh, now, the bill was revised as it made it way, made its way through the state house to allow trucks in those affected areas to still pass. As it was written, they wouldn't have even been able to to pass. But uh, so yeah, there is that issue on on, on left lanes. Also worth uh, kind of going back to um, you know the, the chain issue there in Colorado is uh, there's a provision in there that would authorize studying. Uh, how to improve uh, availability for trucks to chain up or or remove the chains. Uh, so there is that provision in there, you know, as one of the points that was made from the Colorado Motor Carriers Association as far as um, concerns about uh, uh, chaining or being out on the road whenever there's got winter conditions. The point was made that there's a shortage of truck parking in the state of Colorado, and it often will result in trucks, truckers, who do not want to be driving they have to be out on the road because they don't have a spot to park in, in an affected area. Yeah. So definitely some good points made there in Colorado is they continue to uh, go full steam ahead uh, again with this legislation. We'll see if the governor signs that and we'll get updates from you. Real quick, we got a couple minutes left here, Keith. We, we're talking about left lane laws or bills, uh, potential changes. You mentioned Michigan. I know they're one state that's looking at this right now. You've actually got several others as well in your piece on landline.media. Uh, we won't have time to get through all of them here, but a couple highlights uh, of these states that are looking at this issue. I know Kentucky and Florida were kind of on your radar. What are they mm-hmm. doing there? Yeah, Kentucky, uh, you know, there they have a new law, uh, you know, as it is, it has already been uh, in Kentucky. Um, you know, if, if you're traveling below the posted speed limit on an unlimited access highway, you're supposed to stay out of the left lane. Uh, this new law uh, takes effect on July 1st, uh, takes the extra step of including trucks in the left lane restriction. So, um, yeah, not... 
not uncommon. I mean, we see that you, states that have left lane rules in place, and then they go ahead and they, on top of that, will apply a, a restriction for trucks. This one in Kentucky would apply on on highways that have three lanes traveling uh, in the same direction. And then out of Florida, um, a addition to what they already have in place as far as left lane use goes, it's been sent to the governor, most likely to be signed here very quickly. Uh, but as it, as Florida law states right now, is if you are in the left lane and you reasonably should know uh, that you're trying to be somebody's trying to overtake you, you got to get out of the left lane, even if you're driving the posted speed limit. Mm-hmm. What this legislation does, again, that's on the governor's desk, would just simply say you can't hang out in the left lane. Uh, even if, again, even if you're going to speed limit, you, your left lane is for passing only. So we'll see what happens. Left lane use, a hot topic right now. Keith, we'll have to leave it there for now, but we encourage everybody, obviously, to check out your work on landline.media for updates on these stories we just talked about and many others. Keith, a pleasure as always. Yeah, thanks for having me. And that's our show for today. We thank you for listening to Landline Now and look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe. If you want more content, go to landline.media to get updated news, information, and archived editions of our show. Once again, that's landline.media. I'm a dad. A son. A husband. Wife. I'm a writer. Photographer. I farm. I'm a veteran. I love old cars. Fishing. My kids. Chrome. And I am. I am. I am a professional truck driver. And And together we are OOIDA. OOIDA was founded by truckers to stand up and speak on behalf of truckers. We've done that by combining the individual voices of our members into a single, powerful voice. Protecting your interests, defending your rights. Join us. Make your voice heard. Join OOIDA, the owner-operator independent drivers association. Call 1-800-444-5791 or visit OOIDA.com.